opportunity to talk to uh, a colleague that I have been working with and friend that I've been working with for years, Dr. Daniel Kraft. If you don't know him, you will know him after this. Um, and I invited him to deliver a keynote and we compiled a session um, afterwards of truly, truly impactful technology leaders um, that are not only in the past leaders, but moving forward. They have incredible uh, innovations to talk about and the work that they're doing. So let's uh, welcome Dr. Daniel Kraft to the stage. Yeah, thanks. All right, good after morning. <laughs> uh, a real honor and privilege to be here. Can we get the first slide up? As is saying, uh, AI is easy, AV is hard. Um, my, my slide. <laughs> um, so amazing, it's been 10 years since this uh, summit kicked off. I need my slide from my laptop. Um, and you know, a lot's happened over the last decade. Uh, things are certainly accelerating. And uh, we all really have the potential today, if the AV works, to, uh, to you know, reshape and rethink uh, the future of health and medicine. Do you need some uh, AV help? Um, and what I want to kind of cover today, we have a pretty amazing panel to follow, a bit of the arc of what's happened over the last decade and some perspective on what's going to be coming next. One I'll keep riffing. Um, one of the themes I think is, is you know, it's, it's enamored with CES itself is the, is the realm of exponentials. So if you walk around the floor, you see a whole slew of technologies which have se would have probably seemed, you know, magical a decade ago. Um, here we go, and uh, are now really moving faster, smaller, cheaper in really interesting ways. And that's a bit of the theme of digital health um, and how we can sort of unleash that over the next decade. And we have an amazing panel uh, that's going to follow me from, from Google and, and Verily and Fitbit and Nikoli Labs. And I'm going to try and set them up a little bit as we, as we dive into the future. Because many of these technologies, and a lot of them are really embedded across CES, are moving very quickly. Some of them are moving exponentially. And they all have the real potential to take us from sort of where we're stuck in the third industrial age really into the fourth age of, of health and medicine and catch up to where many other fields are from banking uh, to, to movies and beyond. Because if you think about it, we're still stuck in this era of going to waiting rooms, waiting 67 minutes for a 12 minute visit, whether you're in Vegas or Calcutta. We're still mostly communicating uh, by fax machine in most of our clinical settings. Um, we're still stuck in the era of sick care rather than the health care. We're in sick care because the data we get as individuals, as patients, as providers is very intermittent. Usually only when a patient's in the clinic, whether that's an EKG or a blood pressure. Um, and so this intermittent episodic data leads to our reactive sick care system where we wait for the patient to show up with a heart attack or the stroke or I'm an oncologist to show up in the uh, clinic with usually late stage disease. And I think globally what's starting to emerge with digital health over the last decade and moving forward is moving from intermittent reactive to this continuous proactive era, which is going to be anytime, anywhere, and pre precision, uh, precision based on the individual. So that's sort of a meta theme, I think, of where we're moving with the arc of digital health. And of course, that crosses the whole healthcare continuum from keeping us healthy to doing early diagnostics to digitalized therapy to improving access and democratizing care to how we do clinical trials. And I'm trying to touch on all those really quickly. It's starting to hit the zeitgeist. If you get this month's issue of the future uh, of National Geographic, it's all about the future of medicine. I've got the, the first article in there. A lot of it is tied to this era of, of digital data and making that useful for the individual and the healthcare system. And a lot of that change is riding, as I started to mention, Moore's Law, the power of computing getting faster and cheaper and doubling every 16 to 18 months. It's, it takes all these technologies now and are being appified and digitized. You don't buy a, a, a video camera or even a, a GPS unit anymore. And of course, it's only really been 10, 11, 12 years since you know, uh, the emergence of you know, the smartphone, the iPhone, Twitter only launched 12 years ago, Facebook was just coming out of university in, in 2007, Airbnb is only a, about a decade old. So a lot's happened in just the last 10 years, and of course, a lot of that's shrunk into our our mobile devices. I actually have an antique. It's a 10-year-old iPhone 2. 10 years ago, this was amazing. Now it feels well, I'm kind of slow and clunky. It actually still works. So as we're thinking about health, digital, medicalized smartphones and beyond, I want you to be thinking not about where we are just today, but where this is moving. Just you know, perspective. The desktop of 2000 now fits on my Apple Watch. And uh, of course, now the Apple Watch is becoming a consumer FDA-approved medical device, incredibly. And you know, Moore's law may be incre increasing. You'll see on the floor, IBM is rolling out their quantum computing technology. So the technology is going to continue to accelerate. 
The challenge is, though, we have all these new, sometimes exponential data sets, but they're often siloed. They're not connected. How do we put them together to make them useful? All the new data we need to turn into information, right? And to close that da gap. We have, you know, you can have your whole genome, but how do you make that useful for you as an individual or for your clinician? How do we accelerate the closing of that gap? That's, I think, what we're moving into in the next decade in digital health. And what I want you to be thinking about is, Again, not about 2019, uh, but where we're going to be in 2022 is it's often going to be a bit deceptive. There's Moore's law, but there's also Amara's law. We're going to underestimate the pace and speed of all these technologies coming together. Well, the fact that there are now computers the size of a grain of rice, which are connected in the Internet of Things, another exploding area, is not just going to be the Internet of Things, but the Internet of Medical Things. And the Internet of Medical Things is going to shift everything, particularly as this year we're rolling out 5G, which is not five times or ten times the speed of 4G, but up to a hundred times the speed. So what are you going to build with your health and digital platforms riding 5G uh, as it rolls out in the next uh, couple of years? So this brings us to this era of digitization. Um, you know, digital connected mobile health are all kind of buzzwords. I think really the idea is that we have uh, uh, just health that's enabled by this digitization. But it just gives an opportunity to, to rethink things. So there's certainly lots of new funding. We've gone up, you know, 14x on you know, $14 billion last year in digital health. Uh, that may not be enough to really move the needle uh, as we need to. Um, we need to show that these technologies really work. We're moving from the consumer side to the medical side and, you know, from Stanford to UCSF to, to others are starting to look at this da data and really do the clinical trials to prove uh, the actionability. And don't just think about digital. Think about where we're moving with VR and AI and 3D printing and genomics and CRISPRing. All those things are converging often at the digital level to enable us to reshape health and medicine, uh, to address rising costs, aging populations, you know, access to care. No matter what happens to Obamacare or Trump care, which is really no care or Putin care, whatever we get, you know, we need to think about democratizing health care, not just being overwhelmed with exponential data, but making that useful information, helping our friends, the F word, the FDA, figure out the, the role to, to digitize healthware, and our friends, the, the payers, who have the leverage on the incentives. Um, and it's pretty amazing. These big players, the big four, are all coming into healthcare. They touch almost everybody's life, which means we can start to impact the most important, really, area, the social determinants, uh, which are a trump. You know, your zip code trumps your, your genetic code in terms of your outcomes. And of course, we need to pay attention to those underlying physiological needs, which in our digital age are changing. You know, we have new needs, uh, some very important needs. Uh, um, <laughs> But as we put those together, uh, we all really can reshape the future. And I get a, have a seat at the table as the chair of medicine at something called Singularity University, where our, our theme is to cross-train people at AI, robotics, 3D printing, digital health, and beyond, to ask, how do you address a lot of the challenges we have with these new exponential technologies? And because medicine is such a team sport, but most medical meetings are very siloed, I put together, started a program eight years ago called Exponential Medicine, which has now grown exponentially, uh, to bring folks from across the spectrum, from payers to providers to technologists to patients, uh, you know, we have 44 countries there, 800 participants. It's that mixing and blending where the magic happens in reinvention. So a theme there is to always bring people together from different worlds, uh, not just the technology one, but the patients, the nurses, and beyond to, to rethink healthcare. What we do at Exponential Medicine often is bring in folks like that have digital for the FDA to learn where the puck is going. And some of what they learn there has in, informed the new software as a medical device. Just tweeted out by the FDA commissioner yesterday. They're advancing their FDA pre-certification program. So the FDA is really starting to ride this exponential as well, which is critical to making these digital technologies actionable in the healthcare space. So come join us next fall, Hotel Del Coronado. Lots of great talks and other information at exponentialmedicine.com. Okay. So where are we with these technologies over the last decade? Where is it going? Well, we're only uh, uh, realizing now that our behaviors are much more impactful than our, our genomes, and we're now just a decade into the Fitbit era. We're going to have Fitbit here. You know, that was, I had the original one. It's only been 10 years. It's incredible. Uh, these have now become quite ubiquitous. I just got this report this morning about my 2018 data, 2.4 million steps. I didn't even wear it every day. That just came in today. That's not too bad, I guess. But now they're, they're crowdsourcing you know, billions of days and steps in people. We'll talk more about that. And what fits on our wrist is expanding, right? I've got a real estate of mine at the moment. Um, uh, and, and these sensors are evolving. They're evolving from the simple, uh, you know, uh, step counter to uh, RFIDs that go in your, in your pill, to digital tattoos, to the fact that you can use a simple Fitbit or more complicated devices to track a patient inpatient or outpatient and make that data useful. Today, a lot of that digital exhaust, of course, lives on your own devices. It's not connected to your health care We're moving from quantified self to quantified health, where this technology will start to bridge and be integrated from measuring and optimizing your health to early smart diagnostics to optimizing your therapy. And I think that's where the arc of all this digital element is heading. 
So some fun examples of where we're going with not just a digital scale, but now you can do your digital shape, you know, a shape scale. So you can see if you have swelling in your legs or your body mass or your muscle mass, so new forms of a vital sign that might be important is shape, not just weight. Or in the era now, of course, of blood pressure, the number one risk for early death and morbidity around the planet is hypertension. Now, as I just got today, the uh, new Omron Heart Guide, a little edge, my blood pressure is a little elevated this morning, um, uh, is out today on the market and is going to help change the face of hypertension. Or Seamless technology, not wearing any device that can, uh, without squeezing anything, measure 24-7 uh, blood pressure. So these are emerging and are going to be quite useful across the spectrum. And it's not just going to be wearables, right? We're in the idea of incitables, devices that can go underneath and inside your skin for months or years and quantify a whole range of your vital signs and transmit that 24-7. So we're going to be connected with these technologies and in our patient's world, neural dust, incitables, in your brain, potentially for those who need it. Beyond that, there's the idea of trainables. You don't just want data, you want actionability. In our digital age, our postures aren't very good. There's a great Israeli company here at CES I met four years ago called Upright. They make basically a digital mother. You put it on your back, and uh, in our age now, if I put it on there and I, um, I'm not slouching over, which I tend to do, uh, and I bend over for a little bit of time, I get that little, uh, little buzz, and a boom, I'll stand up straight, and about a week later, uh, my posture's improved. So that's a simple example of a, of a trainable. There's also shockables, hearables, ringables. All these things are emerging. Uh, ingestibles, a Fitbit for your stomach. You get the idea. One of my favorite that's relatively new is the idea of an underwearable. Spire has, basically you get 10 of these tags, put it in your underwear, you're always connected. And they're starting as consumer devices, but what's clever about them and others, now the regulations are changing, the reimbursement, the incentives are aligning, new codes are just coming out this year to reimburse some of these digital therapeutics, whether it's a wearable or a digital avatar. And that's gonna be game changing, all right? Because you'll get this data and use it from shakeables, uh, for Parkinson's patients, to optimized therapy, protectables, if you have a patient at risk for a fall, maybe uh, it may not be too sexy, but you'll wear the airbag, uh, there you go. Um, so lots of new ways we'll use these technologies, including, of course, the number one drug, our food, right? Measuring your input and measuring your output. Uh, I know several startups <laughs> in the digital poop space. Not sexy, but uh, it's getting there. And then of course, the idea of a digital nutritionist to put all this data together to optimize our nutrition, whether it's your microbiome and your genome together uh, with your glucometer is gonna be increasingly important. Femtech, there's a baby conference that Jill runs as well. All these things are emerging, and it's again this convergence. A simple camera now embedded with AI can pick up vital signs of a sleeping baby and understand their cry. Um, and you don't need to wear anything today. Wi-Fi alone can pick up the vital signs of up to 10 people in the same room. So, Big picture, we're starting to enter an age where our digital exhaust will be collected 24-7. Our voice is a biomarker to our emotional states. Uh, this Israeli company has been able to pick up signs that change in the voice when folks are going into heart failure. And they can even listen to calls and tell who's likely to survive or not in the next few months just based on your voice. So really new ways of collecting information 24-7 which raises, of course, privacy concerns, the big brother element. Some insurance companies are now measuring your activity and changing your premium. So whole new business opportunities for those who are looking for them. Uh -huh. People pay me to put steps in their Fitbits. All right. Um, so, so what? Just because you can collect all this data doesn't mean it's useful. As a clinician, I don't want to be overwhelmed by step data and sleep data. We need to integrate this. Here's a little cartoon from Exponential Medicine. What is it, Doc? Just as I thought you're, getting, you're generating too much data. It's not data we want. It's actionable information that fits into the workflow of the overwhelmed clinician, right? And en engages each of us as consumers and patients to own our data, to share it, to be the engaged, empowered patient, to use the information in a form that matches us. One of the things that's happened over the last few years in digital health is that the design elements are coming together. So, you know, a baby boomer doesn't need the same user interface or app as a millennial. Different forms of interacting with our health technology is going to be part of this design element. Even new clinics that are sprouting up to be more like an Apple store to integrate digital health exhaust. Now, we have now exponential data. What do we do with it? Like, whether it's Fitbit data or your EKG, we'll hear from Jessica Mega from Verily about the Baseline Project, 10,000 volunteers. Can, integrating their data so we know what a digital footprint of both health and wellness looks like. Or the NIH All of Us trial, where a million individuals are doing a, vir a virtual digital Framingham trial. And where this takes us is what I like to call predictalytics. You will know, and hopefully your clinician, what your sort of overall wellness score is. Are you going to be falling off the, the wagon early? How do, you, how do you catch and have your own personal check engine like that integrates thousands of Internet of Things elements about you and use that proactively as opposed to reactively? So I think the money is going to be in the software and the coaching elements that can nudge us in proactive, positive ways rather than waiting for us to, to have the heart attack. And many uh, uh, elements are building coaching 
Some of these coaches are getting kind of trippy, very uh, uh, AI-like uh, that you know, react to you and uh, uh, you might need a, a different character and they're not real, but we react to them as if they are. So coaching is a big part of this going forward as well. Of course, voice can be part of your coach. Alexa, help, I fall and I can't get up. All these things are coming together. What happens when Alexa's listening to you all the time? What happens when someone hacks your Alexa or your uh, implant? A lot of privacy issues to be mindful of over the next decade as well. Another area that's moving pretty exponentially is this augmented virtual extended reality. You've seen amazing examples now where surgeons with FDA approved elements can see through your body with overlaid uh, imaging data or um, a, uh, a virtual reality. You can put grandma on a roller coaster. That's fun. Um, <laughs> But we know that VR can be therapeutic, whether it's for treating pain or for physical therapy uh, or for someone who's bored or stressed in a hospital setting. That's digital blending with experience, right? Um, and then, of course, the area of digital diagnostics. We don't need to be in the four walls of the hospital, just the, the element of the last panel, the, the hospital coming to the home or to your pocket. The medical tricorder is becoming reality. Um, you know, the echo device. I was never good at listening to heart sounds. Now I can collect that sound and share it with my medical team, and the AI will analyze the heart murmur for me. Or, of course, now uh, LiveCore, now Apple coming out with uh, EKGs. Uh, LiveCore is doing over a million EKGs a month and crowds crowdsourcing that data. And they're not only determining you know, your EKG and AFib, but can measure potassium or all sorts of other interesting elements that are coming together there. So lots of ways of collecting data. I'm going to run through these labs, right? Labs can be done with a medical selfie. Uh, this is a new FDA-approved device. You basically dip it in your urine and use your smartphone camera, which is getting better and better, to take a picture of the colorimetry and send that data of your urinalysis to your doctor, to the CDC, to the NSA, whoever else wants it. Um, and it's integrating into the uh, EMR immediately. So new ways of doing digital diagnostics. Or taking a picture of your fingernails and getting your hemoglobin, right? This is all emerging over the last six months. Um, a medical selfie can diagnose a genetic issue, right? And of course, genomics is riding the digital wave. We're now basically at a thousand dollar genome, soon to be a hundred dollar genome. You can use your genomics, and hopefully your doctor can, to, you know, to understand your pharmacogenomics. How do your genes impact uh, what, gene, what drugs will work, what diseases you're likely to have? Uh, we can start to subset diseases like diabetes into at least three subtypes. So we're gonna really change the nature of understanding health and medicine with this blend of digital and omics and connect those dots, right? It's overwhelming today. We need to connect the dots. Part of that, of course, is using machine learning and AI to blend all these technologies together. Uh, and of course, AI is a hot topic from AI radiology to looking at the back of the retina. It's almost spooky how uh, much predilection these can do. And many of them are getting FDA approved, at least a dozen over the last year. And over the next couple of years, this is only going to accelerate. We won't replace radiologists and dermatologists, but change their practice. And we'll hopefully have our own digital twin, which we'll look at to uh, tweak our therapy. Now, all of this does not replace the clinician. We need to blend what technology does well and what humans do well and be better about that design thinking to go forward and to, to again, democratize healthcare on the planet. And that brings us to how do we democratize therapy? A lot of therapies can be digital. You know, a brain computer interface can help you with your mindfulness training or be a therapy for depression or anxiety. We can use these brain computer interfaces, as you'll hear from Achille Labs, for video games to um, uh, treat things like ADHD and uh, uh, other issues. We're seeing the era now of, of course, the virtual visit, which is now going to be more and more embedded with our digital exhaust. The chatbot will be who you see before you see your doc, and we'll do the initial triage. These are available today. You should all be trying them out. Um, in J China, where there's not a lot of medical access, they're already, uh, with a two-year-old app, over 200 million users. So it's really democratizing care. And of course, we can start prescribing hundreds of thousands of apps. Um, some of them are very good, and some of them are becoming FDA approved. Now, I've already covered several hundred technologies. It's overwhelming, right? So one of the challenges I have, I'm always asked what's best to use. So I'm sort of soft launching today a new website, digital.health, that's the domain, digital.health, where you can go and literally find the related academic journals, the evidence bases, uh, a database of digital health companies. I want you guys to help crowdsource then build this site. It includes basically a form formulary of digital medical devices and apps. So I think um, I'm hoping to help with this community to help build the digital health platform. It's still an alpha version, but a place where we can start to integrate this and hopefully help others uh, uh, understand how to use this technology. To finish off, I'm going to share a technology I'm developing. 3D printing is certainly something that's digital manufacturing. You'll see a lot of it here at CES. Uh, everything from building a cast, which can be digitally tracked, uh, to printing something on the space station. But it got me thinking about this problem of now we're in an era of hopefully personalizing what medicines you should take, but our technologies are pretty much still this for tracking your meds, right? Grandma's on 12 meds, uses the box, or maybe a connected pill bottle. Um, 
But what if we could do better with adherence and personalization in this era of digital meets manufacturing? So I've invented a way to build a personalized polypill, an intelemedicine that's based on you and printed for you potentially every single day. And basically, this is how it works. You would now uh, have a blend of your medicines printed at the corner pharmacy or eventually at home based on little micromeds that would match the dose and needs of you, put them into a single capsule. Uh, here's a sort of version of the printer. And when it prints your personalized polypill, it has your, your name on it, the day of the week, a QR code. And using our new digital exhaust, we could theoretically, here's the prototype printer, here's the software, here's it sort of doing a print, um, basically have a way to uh, integrate and print a med, watch your data, your blood pressure, your mood, and print a new medicine potentially on the fly if you need it. Hopefully we avoid medications, but many folks are on five or more pills a day. Uh, you can watch a TED Talk on more details. So to close this all out, all this is exciting, but we need to have the evidence. We need to think about new ways of, of showing that these things work. We're reimagining clinical trials. You can download a clinical trial today. You can find uh, pharma companies building digital trials. Um, and I think where that takes us, 10 years ago or 12 years ago, we're still driving with paper maps. Now we couldn't imagine getting anywhere without Waze or Google Maps. I think part of this future of health and medicine is this idea of crowdsourcing, building the ways of, of digital health where we know the trajectories of, of how to get to where we want to for health or managing disease and being incentivized to share that information and even gamify it. So let's think of ourselves as not just organ and blood donors, but data donors, and think about all these amazing technologies here that have come through the Digital Health, digital health Summit or here at CS, how they converge, how they're accelerating. So again, in the next decade, think about 2019, think about 2029, where will we be? And I think uh, Bill Gates summarizes it well. Most people overestimate what's gonna happen in a year and underestimate what will happen in a decade. And this is our decade for digital health to become health, to move exponentially, to democratize what's already here but not evenly distributed, and for all of us in this room to not predict the future, but boldly to create it together. So thanks for listening. Now I'm gonna bring up my amazing panel. All right, come on guys. So, coming up, we've got uh, Jessica Mega, the Chief Medical Officer of Verily, Eddie Martucci, the CEO of Achille Interactive, and Amy, Amy, Amy McDonough from Fitbit. And I've asked them each to, uh, to riff a little bit um, for a couple minutes about uh, what they're doing, and we're gonna go with a little arc. We're gonna start with Amy, kind of Fitbit, one of the pioneers of digital, uh, move into new therapeutics with Eddie, and then close it off with Jessica. So, let's start with uh, Amy and uh, rock and roll. Great, thanks, Dr. Kraft. Uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, wow, we've come a long way in 10 years um, and exciting to talk about what we're going to do in the next 10. Uh, so Fitbit, uh, as Dr. Kraft introduced, uh, was really one of the first um, really pioneering the category. When I was at CES seven or eight years ago trying to describe this, there wasn't a word for even wearables yet. Um, but our mission has remained unchanged, which is to make everyone in the world healthier. Um, and how do we do that? Um, and so really it's by providing data and insights and personalized guidance. Um, to really help individuals reach their goals. And now we have the ability to do that at scale. Um, so just, uh, just as the data that was being talked about, just Fitbit data alone, 7.5 billion nights of sleep. Um, imagine what you can figure out by looking, and, looking at all that data and bringing that down to a personal, individualized level. Uh, same thing when it comes to steps, um, heart rate, um, all of those things that didn't exist and we didn't know what that data was as little as three, five, forget 10 years ago. Um, 25 million active users who are sharing their data and more importantly, changing their behavior. And how do we do behavior change? Behavior change really starts with small steps and a lot of it is based on social determinants of health. And so it's really around how you're surrounding yourself with and what data are you using to drive that behavior change. And so those little things can really make for those big changes. 700 more steps a day just by having a friend. So hopefully we can all be friends in this room because I can use all those steps. Rewarding and motivating people. Just little badges, interactivity, um, some, someone giving a positive comment. All of those things have a really important um, motivational factor to not only get you started, but keep you engaged with your own health and being more proactive. Um, and they're providing really insights and guidance. And really where does that lead us is that we're really, where we've been is really thinking about over the last 10 years is thinking about wellness, helping people make those behavior changes to help them better manage their weight, be more active, sleep better. And now we have, because of the data that we have, combining that with the social pieces, we're able to also carry that same into lifestyle uh, changes and lifestyle and health. So we think about diabetes or heart health or sleep disorders. Many of those have a lifestyle component um, that can be managed, controlled, or maybe even reversed uh, just by looking at your behavior and by modifying that behavior in small ways. 
And one big way we're doing that, that can be done across the care continuum and across the spectrum and in real time in a proactive way. And a big way that we're doing that is with the launch of Fitbit Care that we announced this past fall in 2018. Um, and the idea of, see I've already long the wrong year. Um, so Fitbit Care um, is our platform. Uh, this platform really combines hardware and software and services. So it's taking the best of self-tracking, wearable data, all of that uh, that Dr. Kraft showed us earlier, pulling all of that data, and then providing the combination of personalized digital interventions, right time, right place, at home, as the earlier panel talked about, and providing that with health coaching, human health coaches, again, right time, right place, bringing that all together to really have a personalized journey to health to help enact that behavior change. And that's really the next 10 years of where Fitbit is going. So I'm really excited about that and hope to talk to you all more about that next. Okay. Eddie? Awesome, thank you. Um, that's very cool. I'm Eddie Martucci, I'm the CEO of Achille. Um, I feel really honored and humbled to be on the stage sandwiched between uh, what Fitbit has done in health and wellness, what Verily's done in Moonshot um, Healthcare Ideals. Um, and where we are at Achille, is in, we're one of the earliest companies in what we call digital therapeutics, which hopefully many of you at least know that phrase, um, which today is a one small piece in the ecosystem of medicine. What we believe for sure will be one large pillar in the ecosystem of medicine next to pharmaceuticals in the next few years, literally a few years. Um, and I think 2018 was really a catalyst and almost a, a starting year for this industry. Uh, digital therapeutics, what we define is always that software can not just help medicine, software cannot do a lot of the amazing things that uh, Daniel set up at the front, but software can be the medicine. Um, and, and we started with that, uh, with that vision, a few other folks started with that vision about five, six years ago. Um, and just last year, Cowan and Company Research, which puts out essentially the definitive analyst reports on the pharmaceutical industry, said this, um, is that we're seeing a paradigm shift. It is becoming an industry. Uh, we're very excited about that. We have a very interesting take on this field. Um, we don't just make software that treats people. We try to make software that's wonderful and amazing and directly impacts physiology but non-invasively and, as if that wasn't enough, looks like a fast-paced action video game. Um, so we have a lot, of, a lot of firsts, a lot of things that sound sci-fi, um, but what we believe will bring to the world a new type of treatment modality that, yes, is effective, um, yes, can actually treat a disease, but what I get excited about, what my team get, at Achille gets excited about, is uh, beyond the technology. And it's really that while these technologies, we will see prescription digital treatments now and in the next two years um, being, I believe, widely prescribed, it goes so much and so farther beyond that. Uh, what we can do with digital treatments is not just treat someone without a pill, maybe alongside a pill, um, we can actually reinvent and challenge what it means to be medicine. And that's transformational. That's not just a, a really interesting thing that someone says at a keynote and we all nod our head. Uh, that potentially means rethinking what relationship with a capital R means with our patients. It means uh, rethinking how someone psychologically believes they're engaging with their medicine. Today, it is a huge wall. I think we all know this. No one knows and even wants to know the name of their medicine maker. Um, in fact, most people think their medicine makers are evil. Uh, I believe we can reinvent that because what we're putting in people's hands is something that's amazing, uh, something that feels wonderful, that in the moment we believe you can forget you're even taking medicine, um, it can still treat you, and we have immense amounts of data. We collect frame rate data on our video games to feed back and educate the patient, the caregiver, the doctor, and potentially the, the big vision of digital medicine is tweak Every next patient that comes in, tweak the therapy, the treatment, so that it can better personalize, customize, and treat that next patient in a way that efficacy and safety both improve on the marketplace as opposed to being static, which is where we are in medicine today. Um, so I'm excited to talk about very, just in one minute, sort of two things on where we are today. Um, so we are officially under review. 
um, with the FDA for uh, what would be the first of many things. We completed a large randomized controlled trial of our ADHD treatment um, about a year ago, and we're now officially under review of what would be the first um, direct digital treatment that treats a disease with a label like for the treatment of ADHD. Um, we believe that's transformational. It would be the first FDA-cleared video game as well. Um, and really, most importantly, for patients suffering from ADHD, um, it would be the first uh, non-drug treatment for ADHD. Um, we believe this is possible um, because we've gotten to this point. We think this scales and magnifies well beyond Achille. You're going to see dozens and dozens of companies popping up doing good science, good medicine, and bringing digital products to market that can sit alongside and for some patients be the primary treatment modality. Um, so the second thing, the last bit before I turn it over to Jess um, that, uh, that I'd like to tell you is we are uh, at Achille. Um, we're investing heavily ourselves to control the destiny of what it means to be digital therapeutic. Um, what you're going to see in this space, there's a little bit of a psychological assumption that the pharmaceutical industry must need to partner and deliver this for it to be legitimate medicine. I disagree. I disagree vehemently. Uh, we may partner with pharmaceuticals or medical device manufacturers, but we are building today the end-to-end -end, um, what we call prescription through fulfillment process, the entire back end for digital medicine that doesn't exist today, the sales force, the medical affairs, the uh, insurance processing that will enable the platform for scalable digital medicine. Um, it's expensive. We haven't launched a product. We've raised $120 million, um, but it's an investment worth making, um, and it's something that I'm, I'm very passionate to talk about. So um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Chris. Hi. Well, it is absolutely wonderful to be here with you all, and thank you uh, to the panel. So it's wonderful to be talking about not only where we've come, but where we think the world is going in the next decade. And as Daniel mentioned, Verily grew out of Google, and particularly out of Google X. Uh, Google as an information company was trying to think about what other transformative businesses are out there. And so when I first joined Google X as a cardiologist, I found it fascinating to be sitting beside people working on the driverless car, people rethinking about energy and access. What we found out is, uh, as it turns out, and it won't shock anyone in the room, uh, there's a lot of information in healthcare and life science. Uh, so we started to grow quite quickly and graduated into our own company, now known as Verily. And our overall mission, I, I think, resonates with what you're hearing from everyone in the session today. It's, it's how do you take this information uh, that may be existing in silos and actually impact patients, allow people to live healthier lives, and allow for better health outcomes. And, and again, I think that there is a huge inflection point. I can only echo uh, what Daniel said at the beginning. Now, the way we're approaching this takes three basic concepts, and these are the same concepts that we use uh, whether we're working on surgical robotics or whether we're working on diabetes care, and I'll talk a little more about that. But this notion of collecting information, we're thinking about ways to explore immunology, for example. In many cases, we still call diseases as a heart attack or diabetes or oncology, but there are threads across all of these different conditions. So we're thinking deeply about, again, things like immunology, other lab tests, imaging. We're also working uh, with Dexcom on the world's smallest continuous glucose monitor so that patients with diabetes not only get just a few punctuated points of data, but what happens every single day and every single moment. And I, I think that that's really resonating with how do you close this gap. And then importantly, what you can see on the left-hand side of the slide is that the world is changing in terms of health data. We used to deal with a few gigabytes of data, predominantly data that lived in our electronic health record and maybe some imaging. But we are going to see about a 1,600-fold increase in data over the next decade. And the reason why we've engaged with our volunteers and partners with Baseline is to start to think about what would it mean to really harness this information that's coming from the clinic, that's coming from home and coming remotely. And I think even the definition of health data is going to change dramatically over the next decade. How do you then actually handle all of this, this information, whether it's clinical information or digital exhaust? And the beautiful thing about creating this infrastructure, and, and while it takes a lot of lift, 
if you can do it on the research side, again, I mentioned our project baseline study. Uh, we're partnering with the Broad and Vanderbilt to create the information core for the All of Us program. But if you can do it on the research side, you can start to translate it, that into care. And I do believe that's going to be another transformative thing that we'll see in the next decade of how can you actually create a learning health system and not divide research that's very separate from care. And then most importantly, you can get information, you can organize it, but what does it really mean to activate this information? And even in the last few years of, of, our, of our genesis, we've been able to think about solutions and even build companies around this idea. So with the continuous glucose data, what we're doing for patients is thinking about how to create an entire virtual diabetes solution around that. And uh, the team is either happy or, or they get angry at me when I say we're never going to be done. Uh, we're thinking about surgical robotics for clinicians so that you don't just do one surgery, but you link the surgeries. Again, the infrastructure is similar from one project to the next. And then finally, partnering with health systems and regulators. We're part of the FDA pre-certification program. Uh, I think we all need to embrace when we need to regulate and when we don't. Um, but if we do this well, this is really the best way to help people and patients. So uh, it's great to be here, and I'll turn it back over to Daniel. Thanks, Jess. Awesome. So, Fantastic. you just mentioned this idea of like a learning healthcare system. I mean, we're both clinicians and we're still often, you see a patient, you go look a, up a 10-year-old double-blind placebo-controlled trial, but part of the hope, you know, whether it's Fitbit data or uh, your digital video game behavior is that we're going to individualize this and have uh, a crowdsourced learning system. So maybe starting with the Fitbit side and the Verily side, what are things you've learned already that might inform the, the medical side um, using this, this sort of data at, at scales of billions? Sure, so I think um, there's a couple different things. One is uh, the use of data. Uh, it's not just data for data's sake. You know, as clinicians, you all don't care if I walk 10,000 steps a day, but you might care if my data has changed significantly. My sleep pattern has changed. I'm you know, walking what much less than I did. You're gonna you care about changes in behavior, back to your check engine light example. And so I think that's been something is, for us is really how do we deepen our integrations with the healthcare system and work with the existing workflows to provide the right data at the right time um, to make an informed decision and, and it's personalized. Um, so you're gonna give one set of data to the individual. I care if my heart rate changes. I care if I hit 10,000 steps a day. You're gonna give a different set of data and share that data with the clinician, not to replace them, but to help them make better, more efficient and, and better outcomes in care. One of the things I like about my relatively new Fitbit and you get a cardiac score based on your resting heart rate That's right. and can compare you to others your age and et cetera. And that gives you a bit of a, if, if my resting heart rate's 55 on an average and ups, jumps up to 70, something's going on. Jess, do you think there are ways that clinicians are already using this or what, how do you see that integrating into the, the workflow piece? Because many clinicians don't want to see the step or the, the raw data it needs to be made actionable. Yeah, I, I do think we have to work on thinking about what, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. But it really drives it home. Uh, I think I mentioned I'm a cardiologist. And what I'll do when I see a patient in the hospital, I may get an echocardiogram. But then if we're going to do a research study, we go across the street to a clinical research setting. And sometimes I'm repeating that same test. And what we've been learning through projects like Baseline is how can we harness that information um, and stop duplicating all of these different signals because one of the barriers to innovation when we think about health tech, anything we do, whether it's a new medication, device, digital therapeutic, we have to prove efficacy and safety. And if we can harness real world health data, and the 21st Century Cure Act is telling us we have to do this, if we can start to harness this real world data, I think we start unlocking innovation and we're able to test, obviously with consent, these new therapies and move them through more quickly. So um, I'm already starting to see it happen and I'm, I'm quite excited about the notion of these learning systems. And sometimes it's not the expected data, it's not just your heart rate and your blood pressure, uh, you're finding new signals. I mean, you had some uh, incredible you know, data about resting heart rates across different countries and different sexes and ages that become potentially useful. Are there some surprising signals that have popped up in any of your experience so far that, that most people would be shocked to hear? You know, I think um, predictive analytics is really the biggest one. And so, you know, for example, there's been, uh, we're, we're proud to say that we're one of the leading wearables when it comes to clinical research. So more than 600 and six, 675 published research studies. 
clinicians can use that data to overlay third-party data. So one really interesting example is looking at maybe um, what happens when you look at your resting heart rate data and overlay that with um, indications of the flu from the CDC. Right, so are there correlations there? So that's just one example of the type of um, things that we could um, be able to see by marrying all this data together and looking at um, unexpected correlations. So flu data and flu right, research. Right, flu is trends from one. searches, but that might correlate with what your heart rate's done over time and even give your whole CDC and your local clinician or the moms in the neighborhood the heads up to wash your hands. Right? That's right. And I, I, I think this data is even gonna change what we call certain conditions. So right now, uh, we might call diabetes type 1 or type 2 diabetes, but as you have more people where you see the continuous glucose trends, there's likely many different subtypes, and we're already starting to see that people respond differently. As a, as a clinician, I might say, uh, eat these foods, stay away from these foods, but for an individual, that may or may not be relevant. So I think even the classification of what we call health and disease and, uh, and the taxonomy that we use is going to change dramatically. Yeah, and I'd add, especially, well, for us, uh, we're biased, but especially in mental health and neurology, this is an area that um, has kind of lagged in digital, quite frankly, from my, from my estimation, um, but has the biggest problem with trying to segment people into a box of a disease classification. Um, so we work in the, in the um, area of cognitive function, and it turns out that cognitive function is one of the major determinants of long-term quality of life across essentially every disease that touches neurology and neuropsychiatry, but not every patient in a certain disease classification has cognitive dysfunction. So how do you marry those two things or how do you do anything with that? You have to measure it. And today we don't do a very good job measuring. We're asking subjective questionnaires that were built on um, diagnostic principles from 30 years ago. If we have real data in patients' hands where we're measuring not only their symptom reports, we're actually measuring functional performance data. So we're a treatment company, but we measure 30 frames a second of performance data. Um, and we've been able to pull out really interesting signals where we can say, well, this, you know, for, say 40% of this population has a one standard deviation below the mean fluctuating cognitive deficit. That's a totally different way to think about disease than saying that person has depression. Uh, and so the way to intervene and not have these uh, ridiculous, uh, I believe ridiculous standards where we give a treatment to someone with mental health and we accept the fact that two thirds of them aren't going to respond so they go three months of their life with the exact same issue they've been having, um, we can actually hone much better on who the patient is, what's their real impairment, as opposed to the kind of labeled symptom, um, and intervene in a much more dramatic way. But it really does start with functional data that's measured very differently than we measure today. And so to your depression or ADHD example, can you find subsets? Not, not every kid needs the same video game format. Are you finding there might be different Bucket, bucks, buckets that need to be adapted? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so even in our, you know, we ran a, in the world of medicine, a large trial, it was uh, 20 sites, 350 subjects, the first pharmaceutical looking trial that actually put a digital treatment in someone's hands and sent them home instead of a pill. Um, not big by data science, maybe 350 subjects. Even there, um, we're very upfront and transparent with not every child benefited from our treatment. Um, and we've seen in both ADHD and depression and multiple sclerosis that people who have certain bands of cognitive function coming in benefit less. Uh, and so you can actually look at someone, whether it's actually in the clinician's office or even more dramatically and exciting, um, the very first time they touch your digital therapeutic, if you do a quick measurement, we can start to have predictive signals where we say, okay, you're X percent likely to actually respond to this and therefore continue. Um, if we can feed back the exact opposite data to the patient and doctor, look, based on our data, we'd think you're unlikely to respond to this. We're okay embracing that as a business because what that's gonna lead to is more targeted and, and high fidelity treatment for patients, which is what we care about. We believe it's also gonna build a better business. Treating everyone blanket and having half the people fail is actually not good medicine or business. So given that mental health is such a, a huge spectrum and, and cost center and suffering center, um, I think even you know your, your Fitbit or how you're typing your Google searches or uh, how you're playing your reaction time on your video game uh, can be an indication of either you know early neurologic issues. You can start to predict Alzheimer's sometimes 10 or 20 years earlier based on games. Um, what is the responsibility of a Verily or a Fitbit when you see a signal that someone's not aware of? Maybe it's a mental health issue. Maybe it's signs of impending cardiac issue to to get them engaged or to inform them or their clinician and, and to improve the cycle of learning. Any, any 
Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, we, we feel that uh, if that's something that we can predict or have early indication signs of, um, that we feel that there's an obligation for us to kind of provide that, uh, that heads up, if you will, that early warning system. Um, however, you, that needs to be done within the confines of the current workflows and systems. So we're part of the, the FDA pre-cert program that's been mentioned. Uh, how do we bring those um, uh, predictive analytics to market in a way that works with the workflow and the system? Um, how do we find a way to be able to alert a physician that this is something that should be looked at? Um, and in a way that doesn't flood the system, um, but in a way that is actually working and integrating into the healthcare system. So I think that's the challenge and where we'll see a lot of opportunity over the next couple of years. Part of my imagination from 10 years from now is that I'm a primary care doc with 3,000 patients. I don't want to wait for them to show up. I have a dashboard of the three that have their blood pressure running out of whack or the blood sugars that need to be tweaked, et cetera. So That's we've got right. about 10 minutes left. You guys are all pioneers across spectrums. What have you learned in the last decade or so that would inform the entrepreneurs and, 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 and investors and technologists and individuals here that would, be translate, that would translate to catalyzing the next 10? Any uh, deep Happy learning? to start. <laughs> yeah. uh, one of the things that has been uh, most important personally is to think about the, the lens with which you view the world. And so uh, I love being a doctor, I love seeing patients, but it has been so rewarding and exciting and challenging to work with uh, engineers, designers, participants, regulators. Uh, the last session was talking about healers. So really taking the piece that you can add to the puzzle, but having enough humility to know when you can learn a lot from someone else. And I think companies and groups that are starting to bring these diverse folks together are gonna to be the most transformative. That theme of patient included as well. Often someone thinks they have an app or device and, and tries to apply it to the market and hasn't often done uh, the actual user interface uh, or it might be the caregiver or the payer. Eddie, have there been some surprises you've had in developing digital um, therapies? Oh, geez, we could pull out the list that I carry with me. Um, so yes, for, for our company, there's, there's myriad, but I guess for the industry at large, um, one of the things that's interesting to me, I, I love the, the Gates quote that you mentioned about sort of overestimating the first year, but underestimating the 10 years. Um, I think what we saw maybe about five, six years ago in digital health generally is people were measuring by the one year yardstick. And so a lot of technologies that could have had and maybe still do have transformative impact in medicine, you know, and this is partly investors, this is partly the entrepreneurs themselves, there's a lot of time crunch. You're looking at one year and say, ah, oh, it takes so long to do anything that could be relevant to patients truly. So um, let's try to you know, get it out there, make it a little bit consumerish, and, and businesses get taken off track. I think what's been um, fulfilling and surprising to me is the examples of companies where, you know, represented here and many others that have said, let's measure by the three to five year yardstick instead of the one year yardstick. You're seeing that uptick. So, um, you, you know, the number of investors, I speak personally, the number of investors that um, would talk to us without kind of snickering um, and having jokes about video games um, five years ago uh, were very, very small. Um, it would have compelled us or, or any company to say, all right, let's just put something out there on the consumer store, make it more of a game that you know, people kind of like and, and that's all. Um, and you, you fast forward a very short three years and there's now a couple hundred million dollars coming into the space on a six month <laughs> um, sort of biannual basis, um, funding technologies that say, no, actually we wanna work with FDA, we wanna go through FDA. Um, medicine makes sense, let's just give it a few years. I think um, for me, it reinforces and fulfills the point that if you stick through that little bit of early time because you believe in it, because you think it's the right thing to do for patients, that 10 year mile marker is going to look pretty incredible. Um, and so it's something I like, to, I like to reflect on my own experience and to other entrepreneurs, um, which is don't, don't, um, don't shoot your vision in that first year. And especially in healthcare where it takes money and time and data to collect, give it a couple years, but a couple's not too long. So we're thinking about the next 10 years of digital health uh, and health in general. Um, wondering CES, I haven't been to the floor yet, but it's always like the future's arrived. <laughs> Je George Jensen, Star Trek. Um, I'm gonna ask each of you, what's your sort of short-term, two to five year and 10 year sort of maybe vision of what can come together if we really actualize all the potential? Sure. 
So I think in the next couple of years, um, and, and I think I agree with you, one year is a little too short when you're talking about healthcare. Um, but in the next couple of years, I think we'll get the balance right. We saw a big um, shift from human-centered, whether you call it coaching or interaction or care, um, connected care platform, into a big digital shift. Um, and I think over the next couple of years, we're going to see that go back into balance, where it's that right time, right place intervention um, that's very personalized. And I think that's we've kind of shifted maybe a little too far the other way. So how do we get that balance right? So I think that's what you'll see in the next couple of years. And that's really what Fitbit Care is intended to do, is provide that right care, right place, right time in a connected care platform that takes advantage not only of your relationship with your physician, but also the others in your social care network, right? Which is your parents might be your kids, it might be um, you know, someone else who's in your, in your care, maybe it's a, a best friend um, who's kind of your care team overall. So I think that's what you'll see in the, in the short term, getting that balance right. Um, longer term, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been sitting here saying that not only are we going to be tracking our steps and our activity, and, but that we're gonna, everyone is going to know their resting heart rate and they're going to care about it, and they're going to know what it means to their health. So I think we'll see um, sensor technology in particular um, really just be really driving the healthcare system and not be, oh, oh, do you know that number? It's just going to be a given that everyone is going to know these numbers. They're going to be accessible to the physician in the way that you want, um, and they'll be available to help drive that, that care um, in a way that just is not even something that we think about, just as the way you showed the kind of computer trend over the last 20 years. Right, and hopefully the clinicians are more, uh, the, and you have to align the incentives to prescribe the Fitbit or the blood pressure cuff or the video game uh, because you may get a bonus as a clinician or the healthcare system wins. A lot of it is misaligned right now. Maybe folks don't want to have that data. Yeah, you have to align incentives for sure. And, and like Jess said, I think it's a partnership. It's not one company and it's working from, it's kind of disruption from within the healthcare system um, and, and taking advantage of the technology there. Right. Uh, short term, two to three years, uh, I think you can tell I believe that the infrastructure is starting to be there to amass the information and this idea of research and care and always learning and getting the right evidence to make sure that we can really help people is going to be front and center. Uh, as I think about the next 10 years, what excites me the most is for, for many years we've been talking about how do you actually harness that information and collect it, and I almost think that's gonna be an afterthought. So if you think about the genome, and, and there was a lot of hype around the genome, people are saying, oh, would you ever genotype to understand whether someone would respond to a medicine? That's not gonna be the dialogue anymore. It's gonna be the information is there and how can you actually help people? And so it's gonna to start to really, it's not, would you get the information? It's what do you do with it? And I, uh, I think it's a great time to be doing what we're doing. Okay, uh, two, two plus years. Um, I think for two plus years, we focus a lot, uh, as all of us here, on what does the patient see, what's important to the patient. I think patients are going to see in two to three years for their condition, um, across almost every condition, early options that happen to be digital, early options in medicine that are not all digital therapeutic, but whether it's sensors or diagnostics or therapeutics. Um, right now, it's kind of focused on a few core indications, diabetes, ADHD, addiction. Um, I think no matter what type of patient you are, or no matter what condition you have in two to three years, you're gonna start to see, if you do a quick Google search, that there are real options that are starting to scale up. Um, I don't believe they'll be integrated into care in that period of time. I think they're just gonna be coming to the market. Um, in the 10-year time frame, uh, I do truly believe that we're gonna think it's crazy if you walk away from a doctor and only get a prescription for a pill or if you walk away from a doctor and have a single recommendation, like go ahead and walk more. Um, I think we're gonna look back 10 years, when was it, how long ago was it that that only happened? Because of course we should have something digital. Um, or if you came to me and said, hey, my doc prescribed this thing, I'd say, well, where's the digital piece of that? Um, I don't know what it will look like. I mean, I think it's crazy that 10 years ago would we have sat, sat here and said, um, that it looks like you know the phones and the watches and everything. Of course not. Most of us wouldn't. Maybe some of us would. Um, so maybe you should tell us, Daniel. But <laughs> but I don't know what it'll look like. But it'll be there, and I think it'll be ever present. And it'll be a little ridiculous to imagine that we did without it before. Yeah. And a lot of it's going to hopefully switch. A lot of folks are interested in longevity, health span, uh, precision totally. wellness. Because you know, not everyone needs to be screened with a colonoscopy at age 50. It might be 30, or it might be 60. Uh, it may be optimizing your mental health uh, to play video games to do better on the SATs. Um, <laughs> and your wearable devices in your homes will all become integrated and a learning engine, which will 
kind of be a, a health support system that's seamless, not something you go to in an app you have to open. It's yeah. going to become sort of a part of our day-to-day -day life. And that's what's so exciting about the, the big players coming in and the smaller ones uh, merging. So um, with that, we're out of time. I want to thank our amazing panel and urge all of you to uh, go create the next 10 years <laughs> in big, bold ways. Thanks a lot. Thanks.